Hi, and welcome to Kuto Sound. Bjorn Jacobson speaking here, and in this video we'll follow up on the previous video about how to make a spline in Unity. If you didn't watch that one, you can always go back and check it out. Subscribe and all that promotional gizmo mumbo jumbo while you're at it. You see, what is it that we want to achieve? We want to add an object to the spline so that it follows it along its path in relation to where our player object is. The previous soundless world that we had in the first video will end up sounding something like this. A basic level with footsteps, an overall forest bed sound, with a river that follows the player around. Why is this? Because the alternative would be to place river audio sources along the riverbed, and that is inefficient. Not to mention the risk of phasing when they overlap, and it's also much cooler, and to me this is one of the key elements of game audio sound design. We make a system that can work systemically, meaning that with these videos you will be able to script this yourself, or it may give you ideas on what to do with the sound in your current game engine, or just you can show it to your coder. Just print out this screenshot and you go to their desk and you drop it on and then go this and leave. Because that's how we communicate in game dev. And you're fired, by the way, if you do that. Like I said, we have created the spline in the previous video. Now we want an object to follow its path. And let's take a look at how this is done and how we want to achieve it. And as always, I struggle to make this work myself. So I'm really trying to explain this in a non-coder friendly fashion. We have the spline with its spline points, indicating where we want it to go to and from. We have our player as the object we want our sound emitter to follow and be relative to on the spline. This could basically be anything, but in this case it's the player. And let's add an object here with an audio source on. The simplest way to have one object follow another is to have its so-called transform dot position be equal to the transform dot position of another object, simply the object you want it to follow. But in our case, we wanted to find out where on the spline it is and then have our source objects transform dot position be equal to that point instead of the player's point. This will require a bit of math. Uh, trust me, I had to rip out several eyebrows and fingers to understand this and to make it work. So if you bump into any issues, let me know in the comments below and we will swiftly try and deal with it together. Or go over to patreon.com forward slash Kujo Sound. Our source needs to know which spline it should stick to and which object it should follow and be in relation with. So let's go ahead and create a spline mover script, which we can assign our audio source game object to. And just as I said, we'll need a public spline, and we call it spline with a lowercase s. If you're not a coder, and like me, you are wondering, why is it that we have a thing here pointing to a spline with a capital S, and then we call it something with a small s? That is because scripts are case sensitive. And the most important part of this is that you cannot name this whatever you want, because a public spline, the capital S one, means that you can assign any object that has a script on it called spline with a capital S. You know, the one that we made before in the previous video to create the pretty green line along the river. So we cannot name it whatever we want. We cannot name it line, rail, or audio underscore spline. No, it has to be the same name as the script from before. More precisely, it needs to be the name of the so-called class within the script stated here. And we just use the lowercase word spline to indicate that this means that this is the spline we're talking about in the script. And we need an object that we can follow, which means a coordinate. This is a public transform follow object. <laughs> Right. In the editor, we assign the ones that we need. So the spline goes here, and the object we want to follow, as is the player character, goes here. We do also need to know where the audio source object currently is, but that's only something that this script needs to know. So it's a private transform called this transform. At our start function, which is loaded whenever the game starts, or at least this object loads, we will tell it that this transform equals transform. This just means that it now knows that this transform basically is the transform of the current object. The simple code would be here to say that this transform dot position equals spline. Where are we on the spline relative to the follow object in an update function? And that is something that the spline script will need to figure out for us. And this is where math and communication between scripts and return values comes 
comes into play, which for some can be a little bit hairy. But let's not be scared. Let's kill it. Don't worry about the math part in the coming section here. We will try to take it slowly. We need the spline to know the coordinate of the player and then figure out what is the closest point on the spline. We will do that by figuring out which of our spline points is closest to the player first and then do some math on the remaining parts to figure out how far are we from each, which direction are we going, and so forth. So we need a public vector three function that we will call where on spline. And this needs to be defined as a vector three. Well, let's call that pos, short for position. And in here, we need to make sure that the correct vector three values are returned. So when we over in our spline mover script here say, void update this transform dot position equals spline dot where on spline and in parentheses follow object dot position it means that for every frame of calculation here this script will change its current position to that of the spline we told it to follow and it will ask for the vector three value of the where on spline calculation that we made in our spline script in relation to what we tell it to do in the parentheses the follow object position Okay, that, it gets a little hairy, but let's move on here. We simply feed the two different scripts with values. Then we need them to do the math and return the calculated value back to one another. So how does this work? In our spline script, we told it to do the math, which we haven't done yet, for a vector three. And it took an input of a vector three that we called pos, short for position. And we feed it that value in our spline mover script right here. Okay, let's do the math we need. And like I said before, I'm no mathematician or coder, so try this out and experiment or talk to your programmer if this gives you any difficulties, else just ask in the comments below. In our where on spline function, we need to know which of the spline points is the closest one, as I said before. So let's create an integer called closest spline point, and this equals another function that we will use, which we will call get closest spline point. And it takes an input that we will call pos again. We'll then need this function name to exist. So let's go ahead and create it. And remember that this is an integer value of which the spline points we are closest to. So a private int get closest spline point vector three pos. Curly brackets. It's because we only need it in this script, and this is something it does internally, and not something like the other functions which needs to be accessed by other scripts and so on. That is how private and public functions work. There's probably more to it than that, but from a non-coder perspective, that's all we need to know. We will also need a public vector three spline segment, which will figure out where between the two closest points on the spline we are exactly. Basically, which two points we are in between. This function shall take inputs vector three v1, vector 3v2 and vector 3 position. This means that whenever you ask this function to do anything, it needs three values to be fed into it. And yes, this means the two spline points that we just calculated and the position of the player, which we fed it from the spline mover script. Okay, so back to the closest spline point, which we will need to calculate first in order to do anything about the segments. This function needs to deal with an integer value, which we will call closest point, And it starts at minus one. We also need to know a float value, which shall be our shortest distance, which will start at 0.0f. The f stands for float and 0.0 is just simply to indicate that this is a value of zero so that it's not null and can't be used. Okay, here comes more math. We know the spline count from earlier and we now need to calculate for each of those points. Four, and press tab twice and it fills out the loop for you. All you need to do is to replace the word length with spline count. We need to know the square distance between spline point i minus position dot square magnitude. Yeah, it's vector math. Yeah, look it up. And we need to set some rules for those two values. So if the shortest distance is equal to 0, 0.0 f, or the square distance is smaller than the shortest distance, we know that our closest point equals i, which is the current point of our calculation. If none of these match, return the closest point, which we set up here to be minus one. So what is our spline segment that the v123 thing from before needs to figure out? That needs to figure out the direction and movement and so on of what we're doing. So let's define a vector three v1 to position, which hence the name does exactly that. So it is position minus v1. 
and another vector 3 segment direction equals v2 minus v1 dot normalized. Normalized means that the vector is still going in the same direction, but is not considered to have any length other than just one. Something I looked up on vector math, I'm not really sure what it does. What is the distance from v1? We need a float called distance from v1 equals vector dot dot segment direction and v1 to position. That dot dot thing means that it takes the two vectors we gave it and it puts them together and takes the cosine value in between them and multiplies it with it. And since this is a normalized vector, then the results are always, as I said before, always one and they're always in the same direction and minus one if it's in the opposite direction. This means that our calculation now knows if we are moving towards or away from the closest segment or the given segment in the calculation. And then let's set the rules we need. If distance from v1 is smaller than 0.0f, just return v1. This means that the value of spline segment, that vector is now equal to v1, and we use that in all the previous functions that we made. Else, if distance from v1 to the second, which means distance from v1 multiplied by distance from v1, is greater than v2 minus v1 dot square magnitude, return v2, making the spline segment now have that value. Also, else, if the two for above doesn't work, vector three from v1 is equal to segment direction multiplied by the distance from v1, and it shall return v1 plus from v1. This all means that we have found the closest spline point here. We have found in which direction we are moving here, which now feeds correct values into our where on spline function, which means that what is left for us to do is to use these values for something good. Let's make some rules here. Remember we had this closest spline point figure out what was the closest by doing the math down here? Then if that value is zero, where on spline becomes spline segment, spline point to zero, comma, spline point to one, comma, position. But else, if spline point equals spline count minus one, where on spline now becomes spline point and the spline count minus one, comma, spline point, spline count minus two, comma, position. But if there is something to do here for the math, then we should have two vectors left that indicates which is the closest to our left and which is the furthest or closest to the right. Vector three, left segment equals spline segment, spline point to the closest spline point minus one, spline point, closest spline point, comma position. Vector three, right segment equals the spline segment, spline point, closest spline point plus one, spline point, closest spline point, comma position. This simply figures out what was the previous point and what is the next point and then does the math on those. And if that position minus left segment dot square magnitude is smaller or equal to the position minus the right square magnitude, where on spline simply becomes left segment. Or if it's the other way around, it simply becomes right segment. Now, back in our spline mover script, remember how we told it on every frame to update its position so it would become that of the spline's value called where on spline, which we just calculated by this value that we feed it, the follow object dot position? Well, hello. This means that this object now knows where in between the spline points it is. Not only that, it actually knows it quite specifically. If we press play, our object now sticks to the spline, moves along it with us, and because we assigned the river sound to it, it plays a river sound that followed the river, because we set the spline to follow the river. This video was longer than expected, but there was also quite a bit of explaining to do, and if you didn't get the math, then as always, fire away in the comments below. If you like this video or learned something from it, have questions, comments, or need to express your artistic freedom, go ahead and do so in the comments below as well. If you are new to Kujo Sound and my channel, why not subscribe to be kept up to date with game audio content. If you want to support this channel, you can also head over to patreon.com forward slash Kujo Sound, where you for as little as $1 a month can help me sustain this channel. I would really appreciate it and thank you to everyone who's already doing so. Once again, thank you for watching and I hope to see you again in the next video where we will start to dig into details about the objects involved here and also how we can be a little more creative with the audio source object here. This is Bjorn Jacobson and Kujo Sound signing out.